All right. So again, welcome to our, our, our property insurance discussion today, Renew Academy. Thank you for joining us. Property, one of the more complex insurance policies. The, it's a first party coverage, as we said, uh, different than, than liability, which is a third party coverage. This is going to cover damage to our own stuff, the policy owners, buildings, contents, other business, personal property. It's going to work as, uh, as very much a puzzle as insurance policies are going to design to do. There's going to be a lot of elements that are not covered in a property insurance policy, such as equipment, heavy equipment. Uh, if you're a refrigeration, uh, is a big part of your business. Uh, you're going to want a special equipment breakdown policy on that refrigerator, for example. Um, it's uh, the, the property insurance policy, the exposures, the buildings, contents. It's it's more of a, it's very clear cut as far as the identification of what are our exposures. Do we have a building? Do we have a fleet? Do we have uh, intellectual property? Do we have a lot of computers, a lot of tech? as far as contents inside, but it's how much is covered, what's covered, how is it covered? Is it covered properly under the basic commercial property insurance policy or do we need a separate policy? Just like all of our liabilities are not covered under one policy, we need an auto policy, we need a GL policy. Somebody slips and falls in our place of business, that's not gonna be covered under our auto policy. So today's discussion is going to be very focused on the property policy and the coverages within that policy, what's covered, what isn't. So here's our agenda for today. We're going to look at the commercial property policy, the insuring agreement, which actually dictates when we will get paid as an, a policyholder. We're going to look at what property is covered and what isn't. Not everything's covered. Not everything's covered under the commercial property policy. We might need to have a second property policy. Think about it from a, a homeowner's perspective, uh, very similar. Not everything's covered under your basic homeowner's policy, which is gonna cover your building, your home and your contents. But for those of you who are familiar with it or those of you who aren't, jewelry, for example, very small limit in the homeowner's policy. You're gonna wanna have a separate jewelry policy if you have expensive jewelry. Fine art, if you have a lot of fine art in your home, you want a separate policy for that. So likewise, not everything's going to be covered or covered properly or covered well under the basic commercial property policy. Flood, for example. Separate policy for that. Not going to be covered under the commercial property policy. Then we're going to look at causes of loss or additional coverages as well under the property policy. And again, it's not a straightforward policy. So there's separate coverages that are kind of strewn throughout the policy. There's separate conditions, separate exclusions kind of strewn throughout the policy. It's not all in one location. And additional coverages is an important section. Then we're gonna look at the causes of loss forms. Not every type of loss is covered. There's three types of cause of loss, laws, excuse me, cause of loss forms, basic, broad, and all risk. We're gonna look at all three of them. Fire would be covered in all of them. Theft, not necessarily covered in all of them. So not everything is covered in every policy. It's important to know which one you have. And then finally, time element coverages, major coverages, loss of income. So your place burns down, your restaurant burns down, you're not serving customers anymore while you rebuild or while you fix the damage in the kitchen. That type of coverage, not in the regular property policy. You need to add it via time element. Loss of income, increased expense. Not necessarily gonna to be too helpful for a restaurant uh, unless you've got a secondary kitchen you can go into and do, you know, do a pop-up thing real quick, but that, that might count, but increased expense. Anything that you need to do to stay in business to mitigate the loss of income while a covered cause of loss in the, the second section here uh, is being dealt with. So we'll look at those as well today. And then of course, we'll, we'll spend some time on the, the, the risk management element. Uh, but again, not as much uh, risk management uh, per se as a separate topic today as it's woven into understanding the policy a bit more than, than some of the other policies we've looked at in previous sessions. So let, let's talk a little bit about how the policies are written. 
and they're generally written via standard forms, the ISO form. They're developed by insurance advisory organizations for use uh, by most insurers that ultimately purchase their services. Uh, and the forms established by ISO, the Insurance Services Office, are the industry standard. There are forms that are written not standard, not using ISO. And these are authored and submitted for state regulatory approval by insurers. Uh, many do follow ISO closely. Some provide more coverages to be more competitive. Some offer less coverage. Uh, could be to be more competitive in a, in a stricter, more strict level, a uh, more strict area of, of business. Uh, or it could be that, that you, you just want to limit your, the, the risk that you're taking on. Either way, there are a whole host of forms out there just like any other type of coverage. Today, we're really going to focus on the standard form. There's too much variance out there, and it will be too confusing to try to look at every single form out there. Again, most forms are the standard form. So step one is to, to check if it is a standard form. Um, and then step two is, is, is to you know, look through it with, with the things that we're looking at today. Uh, regardless of the exact specifics are today, it's still going to be the primary elements are going to be the same. There's still going to be a cause of loss form. There's still going to be an insuring agreement. So everything's still going to apply. It's just the specifics may be a little bit different. And ultimately, every insurance policy specifics need to be understood by your broker, by you, uh, by an insurance consultant if you need a third set of eyes. But ultimately, the, the only way to, to really understand every line is to read it yourself or, or have somebody explain it to you. They all can be very different. So again, focused on the standard today through the ISO form, and we're going to look at the insuring agreement. So basically, there's an insuring agreement in every type of policy, and it sets forth in broad terms under what conditions the insurer will pay the insured. And a lot of times in the, the GL, the liability policies, it just says, you know, we'll, we'll pay what we're legally, what you become legally liable for. Okay, it's a very simple definition. Look how complicated uh, the standard commercial property policy insuring agreement has. Okay, the insurer will pay for direct physical loss or damage from a covered cause of loss to covered property that is located at a premises described in the policy and is in the coverage territory and commenced during the policy period shown in the declarations. That's a lot. And so we're gonna to try to look at all of that today and understand it. And we need to hit on every single one of those in order for there to be coverage. On the US, uh, the, the coverage territory in the standard form USA, it's territories and possessions, Puerto Rico and Canada. Financial loss incurred by the insured as a result of the direct property damage is not covered. Touched on that uh, in the agenda portion, the, that loss of income, extra expense, not covered under the basic commercial property policy. So we need to add it by endorsement or activation of that time element coverage option if we want it. And this is a key too, direct physical loss or damage. So a lot of businesses who did activate that time element portion during COVID, when during the, the, the mandatory lockdown, we're trying to access their loss of income, their time element coverage, because they couldn't operate. And the insurance carriers were saying, well, wait a second, there's no direct physical loss or damage here. Not a covered cause of loss. In fact, uh, government intervention, civil commotion, those types of things are, are specifically excluded. So no, we're not gonna pay that loss of income. And uh, those suits are still being uh, litigated. Okay, so uh, touched on this up front as well, but here it is uh, again more formally. The ISO building and personal property coverage form sets forth three categories of covered property. Building property, so the, the real property, the building itself. Business personal property of the insured, 
BPP for short, or contents, AKA. And then a little bit of coverage for personal property of others that, that you may be, you know, maybe there, you may have, you know, control over. Uh, but ultimately this is another place where you may need to get a separate policy. If you're a mechanic, for example, and you're going to be bringing in other people's expensive cars, uh, you're going to need a special policy, garage keepers policy. For example, if you're a garage operator and you're going to be moving cars around and, and having a lot of cars, you need a garage keepers policy. Uh, the, the standard policy is not going to, to cover that the right way, if at all. So limit of insurance must be shown in the declarations uh, for each of these categories for there to be coverage. So if you do a quick look at your deck page and there's no limit next to one of these or all of them, then there's no coverage for it. So that's a, a good thing to look at. Uh, a good way to, to determine whether it's business, personal property or building property. Um, and this was taught to me uh, way back when, when I, I first started uh, going for my insurance license is if you took the building and turned it upside down everything that falls out is business personal property or contents everything that doesn't is building so a, a big piece of machinery that's used in operations that's maybe bolted to the floor or uh built right into the the foundation or whatever the case may be when you turn the building upside down that equipment doesn't fall out it's building property. If it's a computer and it does fall out, that's contents. Now, I did say there's a special policy for equipment breakdown. If you're uber dependent on that piece of machinery, where if it breaks down, your whole operation is shot. Again, if you're a refrigeration, for example, refrigerating a lot of items and that refrigerator goes down and everything's gonna spoil, uh, that, that you're gonna want your equipment breakdown coverage for. If you lose power and, and something else other than you need to heat something, if you need to keep something at a certain temperature in either direction, you need to keep the air level a certain uh, percentage quality, uh, you're going to want equipment breakdown for that. But heavy equipment uh, that may be bolted to the floor, but isn't, you know, driving your business or if it breaks down, you know, you're not shutting down. You're not having a, a cascading event of things happening, stock spoilage, things of that nature, suppliers uh, or, or uh, supply chain partners waiting on you, and any of that, then it's probably gonna be just regular building and then you will have enough coverage for that. But the specifics of, of, of equipment breakdown, we're not gonna get too into today, but uh, like, again, if it's super important to your business, You'll probably want a separate policy for that. Super complex, you'll super probably want a, a separate policy for that. Boilers, for example, need you know, complex machines typically need an equipment breakdown policy. So what is covered in a building policy? Well, here we go. Uh, buildings and structures uh, that, again, are specifically identified either in the declarations or in a, a separate property schedule. Any completed additions any fixtures, indoors and outdoors. So, you know, the cabinets that, that we might put into the employee break room or um, permanently installed desks, for example. Again, if they don't fall out when you turn it over, it's gonna be a fixture, it's gonna be within the building. Permanently installed machinery or equipment. So again, you know, if you're a sewing uh, facility, for example, and you've got a bunch of sewing machines uh, bolted to the ground, uh, that's going to be building, but you wouldn't probably need an equipment breakdown policy for that. Own personal property used to service and maintain the building and the premises. Any additions while they're under construction, alterations and repairs to the building or the structure, if not covered by other insurance. Uh, next session, we're going to be looking at uh, contractor policies, the builder's risk policy. So again, the, the, the regular commercial property policy not going to cover everything that a contractor would need. Uh, materials, equipment, supplies, and temporary structures within 100 feet of the premises that are used in making the additions, alterations, or repairs. 
So you do get a little bit of, of space in where you can store some items. 100 feet is the typical. It's not much, but it's something. Again, it must be located, and now we're, we're moving to business personal property with the same 100 feet. It must be located within that on the premises or in the open or a, a, of a vehicle to be covered. So if your business personal property is you left it somewhere at else, you left it at Starbucks, you left it at uh, the office of a meeting you went to, something happens to it, it's not going to be covered. This includes furniture and fixtures, machinery and equipment, stock, essentially all other personal property owned by the insured and used in the business, labor, materials, or services furnished or arranged by the insured on personal property of others, improvements and betterments made by the insured as a tenant, although why those wouldn't be on premises, but you know, they might not and lease personal property that the insured is contractually obligated to insure unless it's provided for under the personal property of others section. Again, there's going to be a lot of unless, but this within the uh, property policy. So let's look at the personal property of others. Personal property of others in the insured's care, custody, or control located on or in the premises or in the open or a vehicle. Same definition within 100 feet of the described premises includes property loaned to the insured, personal property of visitors and employees, and leased property. But again, so if you're a garage keeper, no one, we're not loaning you our car when we park there. We're not a visitor or employee. We're not leasing it to you. So to get the right, the full coverage, we're going to want a separate policy for that. What's not covered? Excluded property. There's a lot of excluded property. A lot. Look at this list. Accounts, bills, currency, you know, money of any kind, essentially. You need a, a crime or a theft policy, for example. Foundations of buildings, not covered. Huh. Underground pipes, flues, drains. Always difficult with water of any kind in a property policy. Roads, bridges, walks, patios, any other paved surfaces. Bulkheads, pilings, piers, wharves, or docks. Hurricane rolls through. A lot of this stuff isn't covered. If you're right on the water. Retaining walls that are not part of the building. Water, land, growing crops, lawns, the cost of grading, excavation, or filling. Any vehicles, license for road use, watercraft, and aircraft. Sure, you, you need an auto policy for that. Personal property while airborne or waterborne, regardless of whether it's within 100 feet. And any property insured more specifically under another policy. We can sometimes have some of those added by endorsement. And again, some are excluded because they're usually covered under other insurance policies. So you want to get the better coverage elsewhere. Physical damage for autos, for example, M much better coverage uh, you know, under the auto policy. That's where you go to get it. Some commercial property insurers may add fleet physical damage under the property policy. Um, depends on your situation. Most likely the coverage won't be as broad or as comprehensive as if you still go and get it elsewhere. There's limited coverage for certain property elements. So coverage may be limited with respect to the limit of insurance. So you may have a million dollar limit in general, but we're still only going to insure, uh, you know, electronic data, for example, for 200,000 or 2,000 or whatever the case may be. Again, similar to that jewelry. You know, they'll, you'll, they'll give you jewelry coverage on your homeowners for 2,500. If you got more than that, you, you need a special policy. They might limit the covered perils. They might say you, you have an all risk policy and we'll talk about what that means, but we're still gonna limit you to just three covered perils for this type of 
uh, coverage, or they might limit both. And so some property that may be subject to limitations, again, you, you gotta check this out. You have to decide and know what's important to you. Electronic data, so severely limited. You probably need, a, need or want a cyber policy if you've got major electronic data issues, detached signs, antennas, fences, other outdoor property, trees, shrubs, plants, animals. If you're a shelter or you're raising animals or training animals or, or caring for animals, probably need a special policy. Fragile articles such as uh, porcelains, china, and not surprising, uh, jewelry, watches, precious stones, precious metals and furs. You need special policies for those. You need inland marine policies for those. And those are worldwide coverage and they, they cover those things to the specific values and it's, it's much better coverage. That's where you go get them. So you'll get a limited coverage amount on this policy. But if you have any of those, if you're an art dealer, if you're a museum, if you have these items in your office, you're gonna want a, a different policy for them. You're not gonna find the right coverage here under the standard commercial property policy. The worst part is, as I mentioned, this is a very tricky and complex policy, limitations on coverage for certain categories. It's hard to identify. They're usually set forth piecemeal across various policy sections and provisions. It's not just one section where it says, here's the limited coverage. There'll be a sentence here, a clause there, a but this as part of an exclusion there. This is excluded, but you have this tiny amount of coverage in this one instance. Covered property, covered locations. So locations need to be scheduled. Coverage is gonna to apply to scheduled locations, again, either in the declarations or if you've got a lot of, of, of locations where it's not one or two that they can put in the declarations, there'll be a separate location schedule need to make sure all of your properties are on that schedule or they won't be covered. Again, it's going to apply to property that's in the open or in a vehicle uh, within a specified number of feet of the premises. Again, typically 100 feet, but non-standard forms might extend to 500 or 1,000, maybe more. Unscheduled locations, not covered. The standard policy will give you some limited coverage of $10,000 for business personal property that you might have left at an unscheduled location. So a little bit of limited coverage given back there on the BPP only. Newly acquired locations. So there is an automatic temporary coverage, usually maximum 90 days, and that's what it is in the standard policy, for newly acquired buildings and for personal property at newly acquired locations. And this is, you know, you picked up a new piece of property, you forgot, to immediately notify your insurer. They give you a little bit of time to come around and let them know, but it's still going to be limited coverage. So you buy a new million dollar building and you, you forget to tell the insurer and on the 89th day you do, but it's the 88th day and the building burns down. You're not getting that million dollars. You're getting 250,000 and even less on the uh, personal property, 100,000, even if you're limited to a million or 2 million or 5 million. So a little bit of forgiveness there, but get a new building, let them know immediately. And that key risk management. Property in transit, standard name peril, uh, and we're gonna talk about standard perils, the uh, basic broad, we'll, we'll dive into that, but essentially no coverage on the basic form, on the most limited coverage, and then on the best form, you can get the standard all risk includes just a little $5,000 limit on property in transit and also only against these causes of loss, fire, lightning, and explosion, even though the all risk is, is a lot more coverage than that. So very little limit, very little reasons for it. If you're a cargo company, you need a cargo policy. That's where you get your better coverage for your cargo. So they all fit together. You're still going to need a, a building pro policy for your office and for your warehouse. 
for the contents in your warehouse. But for the trucks, you need a different policy. For the property while it's on the trucks, different policy. For the, again, the refrigerator keeping the frozen food frozen that you're gonna ship out on your frozen trucks, equipment breakdown policy. All of your data, cyber policy. So a lot of times it's excluded because it's supposed to be covered somewhere else. But a lot of times also we think property policy and it's all encompassing. Fortunately, not the case. Um, there are a few more than these three, my apologies, but still very limited coverage on, on the 5,000 limit. It's, it's these three plus windstorm, hail, riot, civil commotion, vandalism, collision, upset, overturn, and theft of an entire shipping package by forced entry into a locked vehicle. So still very, very limited, very specific, uh, and, and very little limit. Sometimes full coverage for property in transit may be endorsed, but again, most likely and the better way available via separate inland marine transportation policy, cargo policy, there's a few different options out there. Any questions so far? Doesn't look like it, okay. So then we're gonna move into the additional coverages. Debris removal is one of the, the most important. You'd be surprised how expensive it is, you know, after a fire, after building damage, to clear out, clean out, and remove all of the debris. It'll just erode your limit. So they give you a little bit of extra coverage outside of the limit to save that for repairs, et cetera. Uh, so basically uh, it's the cost to remove the debris of the covered property damaged by a covered cause of loss. Remember, there's all these stipulations. Covered property damaged by covered cause of loss. They're not gonna remove not covered property. So they're not gonna clean up your shrubs from the fire. Because again, remember, shrubs were, were not included, not covered. So clean up the burned building elements. Maximum of 25% of the amount of the direct damage loss plus the amount of the deductible is, is the most that they'll do. And then additional 10,000 available if the property damage and debris removal loss together completely erode the limit. So if you've exhausted your limit, including the debris removal, they'll give you, including that extra 25%, they're gonna give you an extra 10,000. And you can endorse that higher. Expenses to remove pollutants from land or water at the insured premises, $10,000 maximum. Again, if you're dealing with pollutants or the potential of that, you're gonna want a pollution policy. Not a lot of coverage here, 10,000 max. If the release of pollutants is caused by a covered cause of loss. So if lightning strikes and your chemicals get out, you'll get $10,000. If there's any sort of plant error, um, or if, if you've got a policy that, that doesn't cover the reason for why it leaked, you're not gonna be covered here. Most likely it's gonna be more than $10,000 worth of coverage or needed or exposure if you're in that line of work. You poison the water or you poison the air. And again, it's only from a covered cause of loss, which most likely isn't going to lead to pollutants if, you, you know, if you're that in that business. Fire department search uh, service charges are, are limitedly covered, $1,000 max, if only they're summoned to protect uh, the property from a covered cause of loss. So lots of ifs, lots of caveats, preservation of property. Uh, if you have to spend money to be transporting the property to another location to protect it from damage, again, from a covered cause of loss, if you've got uh, a lightning storms coming or if you've got hurricane coverage with a, a, a big deduct hurricane deductible on there and you move your property so that the hurricane doesn't damage it. 
you'll have some coverage. Coverage applies during the move and up to 30 days at the, the new location. Increased cost of construction, this is a big one. Uh, increased costs incurred to comply with new ordinances or laws. So places with older construction, this becomes more of a big deal where it was built a certain way, damage was happened, and now you have to build it a different way, a more expensive way, because of changes that have happened since. Apply with ordinances or laws regulating the construction or repair of buildings or establishing zoning or land use requirements, again, up to 10,000. So not a lot, but you get some for each damaged building insured on a replacement cost basis. We're gonna talk about the difference between replacement costs and actual cash value. It's another critical caveat that completely changes how your policy operates, how you'll get paid out on a loss more specifically. And again, this coverage applies only to costs associated with damaged property. If the coverage is needed for demolition or increased cost of construction for undamaged portions of the property, it must be added by endorsement. So if the half the building's damaged and half isn't, but you need to demo and rebuild because of new uh, ordinances or laws or zoning, if you don't have this endorsement, that other half is still on you. Electronic data, aggregate limit of $2,500, cost of replacing or restoring electronic data that has been destroyed or corrupted by a covered cause of loss including a computer virus, hacker is not most likely a covered cause of loss and you only have $2,500 worth anyway. Not a lot of coverage there. Need a cyber policy. Talked about the newly acquired property provision, $250,000. Uh, you know, if you forgot to mention it within that 90 days. Personal effects and property of others that you might be holding on to, little $2,500, not a lot. No coverage applies here to the loss of personal effects by theft. It's really not a whole lot of coverage there. Valuable papers and records, again, you're gonna want a special policy for that, $2,500 only. You can endorse it higher, but again, you might just, it probably best just to get separate policy. Property off-premises we talked about as well, uh, but here it is again, $10,000 max limit. Um, if you've got property at a fair, an exposition, or a trade show, storage at location leased after the inception of the policy or temporarily away from the premises at a location not owned, leased, or operated by the insured. $10,000 max limit. Very little coverage for outdoor property, 1,000 limit for the loss to outdoor property. So they give you a little bit here for trees, shrubs, plants, they give it back. And then a sub limit of 250. So even though they give you 1,000 for, for signs, fences and antennas really, but then 250 each for trees, shrubs and plants. And it's covered for only fire, lightning, explosion, riot, civil commotion or aircraft. Non-owned detached trailers will give you a little bit of coverage for as well. Lost to non-owned trailers, detached trailers used in the insured's business. So again, caveats and in the insured's care, custody and control, only up to 5,000 unless you endorse it or more likely you want that on a different policy. So now we'll talk about the cause of loss forms. There's three of them and this is what would be covered. So we've got your covered property, your covered locations. Now, what has to happen to them in order for that coverage to apply? So the first is the named perils, or there's two types of named perils. And this, in each of these, coverage exists only if a peril is specifically listed. So basic is gonna give you the least amount of coverage because it's only covering your building, your business personal property, your personal property of others against fire loss, lightning loss, Extended coverage perils package, which includes windstorm, hail, explosion, smoke, civil commotion, aircraft, and vehicles. Vandalism, sprinkler leakage, 
any volcanic action. Don't have a lot of that in Florida, for now at least. Any sinkhole collapse. So if you have a basic form, it's gonna be cheaper than if you have the broad, but it's only going to cover these 14 items. Somebody steals something, not covered. So let's look at the broad. It's another named peril form. Coverage exists only if the peril is listed. And it's got the 14 basics, so all of those. And then it's going to give you some more. It's going to give you falling objects, weight of ice, snow, or sleet. Again, not a big deal in Florida for now. Uh, water damage from appliance leakage, collapse from specified causes. So again, that there's going to be some limitations in there. Nuclear hazards, war or military action, government seizure or destruction of property, building ordinance enforcement, some off-premises utility service interruption. Again, if you're heavily reliant on electricity, to be protecting of, of things you're storing or of a process. You may need equipment breakdown coverage to get better coverage on this. I'm sorry, I jumped ahead just a little bit. The broad stops at collapse from specified causes. That's it. You get the basic uh, form perils, the 14, and then these four additional falling objects, weight of ice, snow or sleet, water damage from appliance leakage and collapse from specified causes. So still not a whole lot. Then we're going to move into causes of loss forms, all risk. Yeah, it sounded weird to me. I'm saying these things aren't covered. What, what's going on here? So essentially with the all risk form, it's the opposite of the name peril. So the name perils, remember we said coverage exists only if the peril is listed. And then we go ahead and list them out. 14 in the basic. And then with the broad, all of the basics, plus these four more. With the all risk, it's the opposite. Coverage exists only if the peril is excluded. So we don't list fire, lightning, falling objects. They're all automatically covered on the all risk because they're not specifically excluded. Instead of a list of things that are included and no list of exclusions on the basic and the broad, we're not gonna have a list of things that are covered. We're only gonna have a list of exclusions. And here are those exclusions, nuclear hazard, war and military action, governmental seizures or destruction of property. None of this is gonna be covered under your property policy, even if you go for the all risk, all bells and whistles, best coverage you can get. And I highly recommend you go for the all risk. Building ordinance and enforcement, the off-premises utility service interruption, definitely need a special policy for that. Earth movement, water, the flood policy, as I mentioned, sewer backup, all of that's still gonna be excluded even in an all risk, quote unquote, or special form policy. Delay loss of use and loss of market. So anything that's happening internally that, that's delaying you bringing a product to market, makes sense, that's not covered. Smoke, vapor, or gas from agricultural or industrial operations. Again, you need a separate policy from that. You want a pollution policy for that. Wear and tear, just because things are getting old doesn't mean they're gonna be covered. Likewise, dampness, dryness, changes or extremes of temperature and marring or scratching, uh, not gonna be covered. And that's with respect to personal property only though. So get a little bit of coverage back. There will be coverage if everything else is in order for the building. Damage to electrical devices by artificially generated electric current, mechanical breakdown, boiler explosion, all of that excluded here Go get coverage for that under an equipment breakdown, a boiler policy, according to the, the authors of this policy. We're not gonna cover it. You can go get coverage, better coverage, more comprehensive coverage elsewhere. We're not set up for that. Lost to steam and hot water from any condition within the equipment. Again, equipment breakdown policy, seepage or leakage of water. Presence of moisture, humidity over a period of 14 or more days. So if you're just sitting there, letting it leak and not doing anything about it, don't come to us two weeks later and then have us fix it. Do what you can to, to get rid of that leakage immediately. Let us know. And day one, we'll help you. Rain, snow, ice, or sleet damage to personal property out in the open. You left it out there. 
you left your computer in the courtyard because you were you know taking a you were working outside it was a beautiful day you left it out there it rained we're not covering that weight of snow ice sleet on gutters or downspouts again not really a concern in florida damage to building interiors by rain snow sleet ice sand or dust so if you leave a window open and rain comes in and damages the floors and damages the computer not going to be covered if lightning strikes the roof and creates a hole or wind from uh you know blows a hole in the roof somehow or, or a tree gets blown and crashes into the roof and then uh, rain snow sleet ice etc pours in damages your floors damages your computer then it would be covered but even in that case thawing of snow ice or sleet would not be so this is a prime example of how complicated these policies are this is excluded unless this except for this so they take it all away damage to interiors then they give some back unless the roof or walls was first damaged and then they take it a little bit away again except if the damage was done by thawing of snow ice or sleet so if if thawing snow damages the roof and then rains in there it's not covered but other than that if the roof or walls were first damaged by a covered cause of loss and then it rains in it will be covered Leakage from equipment caused by freezing unless certain precautions have been taken. Collapse, except when resulting from certain specified causes of loss, such as hidden decay, uh, insect or vermin damage, weight of piece of people or personal property or rain that collects on the roof. Faulty workmanship on materi or materials if loss occurs during construction or renovation. And release of pollutants excluded, get a pollution policy, they think, or they say, except when resulting from a specified cause of loss. And again, there's just that very limited limit amount of coverage that you get. Continued exclusions here, employee dishonesty, employee theft. You need to have a crime policy for that. Voluntary parting with property and unauthorized transfer of property. So if you just hand it over. We're not covering that. Missing property when the only evidence of loss is inventory shortage. So either you made an inventory error, your supplier made an error, somebody stealing internally. Either way, none of that type of stuff is covered under the standard property policy. Theft of building materials and supplies not yet attached to the buildings. So again, if you're a contractor and you've got a lot of supplies around the buildings, you're going to want a special policy for that. Otherwise, store them inside. Loss from fungus, wet or dry rot, and bacteria, unless resulting from fire or lightning. And except is provided if you add the $15,000 fungus additional coverage provision. So if something's not covered, step one is to figure out, is there a way to endorse the coverage? Step two is to figure out, is there a better way to cover it outside of the policy? And step three, decide which of those is best for you. So unless the causes are from the basic or the named, even if you have an all risk, any loss to valuable papers or to animals will not be covered. Again, you still just need a special policy for those. Builders, machinery, tools, and equipment off-premises, breakage of fragile articles, separate policy. And there's still going to be a sublimit for theft, even if there is some coverage for furs, jewelry, patterns, dyes, and molds, letters of credit. You need special, separate policies for these. Some other important uh, commercial property policy elements. If there's vacancy, the way the coverage works changes. There's protective safeguards that, that may be involved in the policy. These are risk management issues, cancellation provisions, how the property is val the, the valuation, the co-insurance provision, the limit structure, and the application of deductibles. All of these are risk management elements and operating within the policy that you need to understand. So we're going to touch on each of those. Coverage usually is restricted, and, and on the standard policy, is restricted on buildings that have been vacant beyond a specified period of time. It's usually 30 or 60 days. 
for the standard policy, it's 60 consecutive days before the loss. So if the building is vacant for 60 days before the loss, vandalism will no longer be covered. It was covered, now it isn't. Sprinkler leakage, no longer covered. It was covered, now it isn't. But if you did go ahead and protect it from freezing and there was still sprinkler leakage, then we'll still go ahead and give you coverage. Any building glass breakage, there was coverage, now there isn't. Theft or attempted theft if, if the build in the building where the loss occurs. So if you have an all risk policy, uh, theft was covered, now it isn't. Uh, theft was never covered in the basic or the broads. Also, for all of the other elements that are still covered, so we just have vandalism, sprinkler leakage, building glass and theft, which are taken away, we're still gonna limit each and every one of the other ones. So if you had the basic, uh, we're still limiting the other 10. If you have the all risk, we're still limiting everything that's not excluded. So the recovery for the other insured loss, it's gonna be reduced by 15%. So you're only gonna have 85% of what you would have had ordinarily if it was coming from a vacant building. Protective safeguards. Uh, it's an endorsement, but it's really, a, it's a negative endorsement towards the policyholder. It makes it a condition of coverage, whatever the endorsement is, whatever that safeguard is, such as an automatic sprinkler system or night watch guard, be in operation at all times. And if that wasn't in operation, so if there's a protective safeguard saying you need a night watch guard or you need that sprinkler system and it wasn't active, that sprinkler system wasn't in operation, that night watch guard was on vacation and you didn't bring somebody else in, and something happens, that protective safeguard wasn't met, you do not have coverage anymore. Except if the insurer has been notified of the impairment in protection. So our sprinkler system is down. We're bringing somebody in to repair it. Here's when they're coming, please be notified. Okay, now if something happens, now if there's a fire and that sprinkler system isn't in place, isn't active, you will still have coverage. Our night watch guard just got appendicitis. He or she's gonna be out, left immediately. They're gonna be out for, the, for a few days. We can't get somebody back here in time. Okay, now if something happens, you'll have coverage still. Failure to maintain the protective safeguards in good working order or to notify the insurer of even a temporary impairment in the protection suspends coverage until the protection is restored. And so be very careful about what they're adding as a protective safeguard onto your policy. And then you know, try to get none on there, but whatever is on there, be very, very, very aware of and make sure that you are meeting it at all times or you will lose coverage. Cancellation, not as stark or dire uh, a provision. Essentially you as the insured may cancel the policy at any time simply by notifying the insurer in writing. Some policies will carry minimum earned premiums. So you wanna be you know, mindful of that. Uh, for the insurer to cancel, it must provide the insured with advanced written notice. If it's for non-payment of premium within 10 days and 30 days typically for, for any other reason. And it is 30 days in the standard policy. Property valuation, we touched on replacement cost versus actual cash value. Replacement cost is the cost to replace new today with materials of like kind and quality. This is the one that you want on your policy. Actual cash value will save you a, little, a few dollars on the front end, rarely formally defined. Essentially, it's, it's replacement cost minus depreciation. So you're not getting the full value back. And oftentimes the choice of valuation is not even going to impact the rate. So there's really no reason to go for actual cash value. And even if they are giving you a little, you know, a little bit back, still not worth it. Uh, also notable here, book value is no relevance in this method of valuation. The accelerated depreciation that typically is reflected in book value, uh, not gonna help you here. It's gonna lead to an insufficient uh, and unsatisfactory loss settlement. So uh, replacement cost is the cost to replace new today with materials of like kind and quality. That's what you want. You don't want actual cash value where they're taking depreciation away. They're not repairing to new of today. 
Here's a big one, coinsurance. A lot of uh, difficulty with this, uh, understanding it, making sure you meet it. It's a provision requiring the insured to insure the covered property to a specified percentage of its full value. It's usually 80, 90, or 100%. And usually it's, it's in exchange for a coinsurance rate credit. Uh, again, these credits are not worth it. You want to not have coinsurance if you can. Most of them are going to carry it, though. If at a time of a loss, the limits carried are less than those required by the provision, the loss recovery will be limited to the same percentage of loss as the ratio of the amount of insurance carried to the amount of insurance required. What exactly does that mean? This is the easy way to think of it. The coinsurance formula. Did over should times the amount of the loss minus the deductible equals the loss recovery. Did equals what limit did the insured have at the time of the loss? What were you carrying? What were the limits at that time? Should is what limit was required per the coinsurance provision? Loss amount, self-explanatory, deductible, self-explanatory. So here's an example. A building has a replacement cost value of $2 million. So to repair with new, uh, to, of, of like kind of quality with new materials, as we said. $2 million replacement costs and is insured under a commercial package policy with an 80% coinsurance clause. So what does that mean? It means that we need to have limits at least be 1.6 million. And what, what, what does this protect against from the insurance or the insurer's uh, standpoint? Well, I've got a $2 million building. It's a really, really large building. We've got a lot of protective safeguards in place. It, it's going to be a long shot that there's going to be a, a total loss where we're going to lose the entire building. So why don't I try to be smart and only take out an insurance policy of a million dollars? Because I think worst case, only half of the building is going to burn down. I'm going to get a half rate uh, premium so I can save some money here. Uh, the insurance company is trying to protect against that. They want the insured to have more skin in the game and have more uh, cause to protect the building. That's their, their viewpoint, at least. So they put this co-insurance clause on there to make sure that the building is at least insured to what they feel comfortable. So they put 80% on this. That means the limit needs to be 1.6, okay? Well, this insured decided, you know what? I really don't care. I still want to only insure a limit of 900000 and there's a $1,000 deductible. Okay, so that's the setup. It's a $2 million building, 80% coinsurance policy the insured agreed to, which means they should carry a limit of 1.6 million. They did carry a limit of 900,000 instead. At the time of a the loss, they lost 250,000 in this example. So what you do is you take, what did, what did they have? 900,000 over what should they have had, the 1.6, the 80% coinsurance provision, that's going to give you a number of 0.56. So what we do then is multiply that by the amount of the loss, subtract the deductible, and that's going to be our recovery. So the 0.56 times 250,000 gives us 140,000. We had a $1,000 deductible we owed. So our loss recovery on a $250,000 loss is only going to be 139,000 because we didn't carry the full limit that the uh, carrier was requiring. They didn't even require us to do the, the full 2 million, but they did want 1.6. We carried 900, which was 56% um, of what they wanted. So they're going to pay us 56% of the loss minus the deductible. Very important uh, if you've got a lot of buildings or even one building to understand what those values are, what your coinsurance percentages are and make sure you have your limits set properly so that you get paid out fully and not at 56 percent. So you can get agreed value on the policy which eliminates the coinsurance requirement and the insurer usually needs a signed statement of property values and a recent appraisal uh, to set that and it typically expires one year from its effective date or on the policy anniversary date. If the insured fails to submit updated statement of values prior to the expiration of the agreed value provision, the coinsurance clause is then reinstated. So agreed value is a great way to go. You don't have to worry about replacement costs. You don't have to worry about coinsurance. 
You're just going to get that value. Limit structure, they can be scheduled limits, separate limit of liability applies for each type of property, or you can get a blanket limit, which is much better, uh, especially if you're transporting inventory from one location to another consistently, or if value, values are, are fluctuating consistently. Uh, it's a single limit of liability that's gonna apply for all types of property at all locations. And also rather than, you know, it, it, it helps to, uh, take away any error that you might be making in your estimates. So if you've got four buildings and you think three of them, well, two of them are worth a million each, one's worth 1.5 and one's worth uh, half a million all in with contents and with the building itself. What is that? One million, two million, three minutes, four million total, right? One million each for two of them, one and a half for one and a half for the other. You could schedule the limits. 1 million for building A, 1 million for building B, 1.5 for C and 0.5 for D. But then what if you made a slight error or you transferred some, some, uh, some content, some, some inventory, and now building D at the half million limit suffers a three quarters of a million limit loss or a million dollar limit loss because you made a mistake. Well, you've only got your half million limit there. Meanwhile, if you had a blanket limit for the same total 4 million estimate, but now you have that 1 million loss at site D, you still have the 1 million in coverage. Or if you have a $1.5 million loss at site A, you've still got $4 million worth of coverage there. They can be written to exclude certain locations to be available only to certain types of property. Again, helpful when inventory is frequently moved, removes the necessity uh, of, of knowing the exact amount at each location and forecasting that you can, you know, the forecasting becomes less important as far as this uh, is, goes, you know, as far as, far as your demand and all that, it's not gonna help you there. But as far as forecasting what's there and when and, and how much you might need in coverage at any one time, the blanket limit is definitely the way to go. So a blanket limit and an agreed value provision protects you that much further, serves as a hedge against the possibility of inaccurate property value estimates. Specific limits required that the values used to set them are extremely precise and account for fluctuations when you're, uh, when you're in the specific limit format. Blanket limits, again, they afford that margin of error. Blanket limits, highly, highly recommended. And then finally, in the other important provisions here, uh, we're looking at the deductibles. Most property policies include a deductible, the standard, uh, CPP utilizes a single deductible. Other forms may apply the deductible separately to each building, to the contents, to the property. Um, you know, singles best. We're going to talk very briefly about the time element coverages. Again, loss of income, including any rental value, extra expense, dependent properties, loss of income or extra expense, all not covered unless you get them endorsed or unless you have a separate time element coverage policy. The, the loss of income portion is gonna be the primary time element exposure for organizations whose operations depend on particular buildings and their contents. So manufacturers, retailers, restaurants, in the event of severe damage to their facilities, these types of organizations would probably have to shut down until they're repaired. It's gonna be more difficult to go set up a new kitchen or set up a new manufacturing assembly line probably just gonna to need to, to repair what's going on in your regular location and deal with the loss of income. Meanwhile, organizations providing services and whose property is not a critical source of their income, most likely the extra expense is gonna be the, the time element coverage that they need. They'd typically be able to operate from temporary facilities in the event of damage to their own with little to no loss of income. So any expenses related to arranging equipment, operating, any temporary facility on the, you know, at a moment's notice are likely to be far in excess of normal operating expenses. They're all covered. Any extra expense needed to operate your business, to keep it up and running, a temporary office space, uh, a leased vehicle, temporary computers, a temporary internet connection, all of that would fall under extra expense to keep your business up and running to limit the loss of income. 
contractors, insurance agencies, a good example of these types of industries. And then the last one, dependent properties. So this is coverage for a loss resulting, again, a covered cause of loss to a key supply chain partner, a key supplier or customer. If their building burns down and they can't get you the computer chips, you're gonna lose some income or you need to, to spend extra to go to a different supplier. That's going to be covered if you've got dependent properties, income and extra expense. If you don't, it's not going to be covered. And again, it's a covered cause of loss. So I mentioned fire. You know, if they go out of business because of poor management, that's not going to be covered. It's a covered cause of loss. That's the same causes of loss on your buildings. All right. And then finally, we'll, we'll do a, a little discussion here on property hazards and controls outside of the insurance policy itself. Management programs, doing timely inspections, housekeeping and maintenance, making sure you're correcting any hazards that are, are there, making sure you're, you're, you're upkeeping, you're not leaving um, you know, snow and ice on critical areas, you're getting rid of that. You know, if there is a, a, a window open, you shut that if a rainstorm's coming. Any other special hazard policies that might apply? Fire protection services. Do you have an internal fire brigade? What type of external fire department are we dealing with? What's the protection class? How close are they to us? Proximity to service, water and access. Are they volunteer or full time? What type of sprinkler system do we have? And is it a protective safeguard embedded in our policy? Is the fire alarm system a protective safeguard? Is it central station versus local? Smoke and heat detection, water flow detection. What type of construction is the building? Again, down in Florida, flood, hurricane, gonna be more important to build against that than earthquake, which you'll wanna build against in San Francisco or tornado, which you'll wanna build against in Kansas. What type of security protection if we have valuable items, business, personal property inside, physical barriers, safes, locks, bars, bulletproof glass, any lighting, camera systems, again, alarm systems. And finally, what, what loss control methods? Are we segregating in different areas of a building? Do we have fire uh, walls in place? Are we, uh, you know, again, segregating within that building? Are we separating to a different building? Are we keeping important pieces of uh, business personal property in different locations? Are we duplicating? So if something happens to one, we still have it safe somewhere else with another or in another location, another part of the building, another country. All of these are important property hazards and controls. So and there's a lot of information in the property that the policy is so detailed and complex uh, I don't see any questions raised. Are there any questions? Certainly, uh, if there are, it doesn't look like there are, okay? If there, if you do have any questions pop up, you, please reach me here, agold at, at renewinsurance.com. Happy to answer any questions that you might have. If you need a property inspection checklist, uh, if you wanna have a discussion as to what your exposures are or uh, what type of uh, separate pol uh, property policies you need outside of the CPP or anything property at all, please don't hesitate to reach out, agold at renewinsurance.com. Our next session is going to be on builder's risk, as I mentioned, coverages, exclusions, other key provisions, and the risk management advantages of controlled insurance programs. This will be on August 18th at 2 p.m. So once again, thank you very much for, for spending your time with us. One last time, any questions? Okay, thank you very much for, for spending uh, your afternoon with us at Renew Academy. We look forward to seeing you next time. Have a great afternoon.